Okay, diving deeper into how urine is actually formed. So these are those three main processes that I was mentioning um, in the last video. So as part of urine production, the first thing that's gonna happen is filtration, right? And that's this blue arrow. So this is showing us that, that the blood in the glomerulus is getting filtered. Filtrate, right, the stuff that gets through, enters um, that Bowman's capsule, um, and then it goes into these renal tubules. So the thing to think about um, with filtration is I think of it just like um, making coffee. <clears throat> Let me see if I have... This is going to be a wonderful drawing, right? So think about making coffee. So you have your little coffee filter, right? And you have all of your coffee grounds, i.e. your solids, right? Up in this filter, okay? And then what we're looking for is what's going to actually drip through the filter. This is your, oh, that didn't work. This is your filtrate. Okay, so when you're drinking coffee, you're drinking filtrate. Now the same rules apply here. Notice that when you're making coffee, the, the, the grounds stay behind, the big items stay behind. The same thing happens when you're filtering blood. Things like blood cells, right? Red blood cells, white blood cells, um, platelets, big things like proteins um, should stay behind, right? They stay in the bloodstream. What drips out, the filtrate then, is a lot of water, a lot of solutes, so small things, sodium, chloride, any of the ions can fit through there. Um, monosaccharides, things like glucose, will actually get filtered um, out of the blood. Okay, so that's what's going on um, with filtration. Now, reabsorption, this is number two, right? And they are showing us that um, both solutes, and water are reabsorbed. And again, remember this means that those items are going back into the blood supply, back into these paratubular capillaries. Now, a lot of this varies dramatically on what region of that renal tubule that you're in, right? So if we look back here, okay, at the proximal convoluted tubule, reabsorption is a huge role right, in the proximal convoluted tubule. Water is reabsorbed here, like a lot of water is reabsorbed in the PCT. Um, ions like sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, calcium, bicarbonate, right, a lot of these ions are going to get reabsorbed here. And notice all, all of the organic nutrients. So any glucose, um, amino acids would actually be small enough to end up in here, um, any of your vitamins, all of those organic molecules should be reabsorbed at the PCT. Okay, no more of them in the filtrate, no one else has to reabsorb them, right? We took them all back to the blood. And think about it, those are the most expensive things we have, right? Glucose, amino acids, um, and vitamins. In the nephron loop, what we're going to see being reabsorbed in the descending limb, we are going to see water being reabsorbed. And then in the ascending limb, over here, is where sodium and chloride are going to be reabsorbed. And we'll, we'll look at this again. I just want to lay this all out to start. Okay. In the distal convoluted tubule, notice that there is still reabsorption um, taking place here. There is reabsorption of water. Um, though notice it says variable, and what they're trying to indicate here is this is very much under hormonal control, right, of things like antidiuretic hormone, right? So the variable reabsorption of water, the variable, variable reabsorption of sodium, so this depends on aldosterone, right? Um, calcium ions, that would be PTH, right, parathyroid hormone, determining the reabsorption um, of all of those ions. So the reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule is just like, go, 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 what can we get? Um, and then in the distal convoluted tubule, we're kind of fine tuning things and it very much depends um, on the hormones. In the collecting duct, uh, we continue the variable reabsorption of water um, and ions. And so again, this is going to be under the control of antidiuretic hormone. 
um, sodium continues to be under the control um, of aldosterone. We'll also see reabsorption, um, again, variable of things like potassium. We also do a huge um, amount of our acid base balance here. So again, we might reabsorb hydrogen, we might reabsorb bicarbonate, depending on the body's needs. But all of this can be reabsorbed. All of this can go back to the blood. Okay, and then the third and final thing that happens along all of these nephron tubules um, is secretion. And again, you secrete it to excrete it, right? These are the things that we want to get rid of. Um, in the proximal convoluted tubule, secretion is pretty minor. There's some drugs and acids and toxins that get dumped in here, but it's a relatively um, minor role. In the distal convoluted tubule, this is where we start to think much more about secretion. Again, ions, acids, drugs, toxins, anything we want to get out of the body, we're gonna go ahead and add into the filtrate. Um, in the, notice I didn't mention the nephron loop, there's no secretion there. In the collecting duct, again, secretion is those things that we want to get rid of. So again, it depends. Um, it might be sodium, it might be potassium, it might be hydrogen, it might be bicarbonate, okay? But that is what we're looking at, right? The big picture of filtering the blood, reabsorbing what we want to keep, and secreting, um, adding in there what we want to get rid of. Okay, so then let's look um, in a little more detail um, about how all of this is happening. So we're going to start out at the renal corpuscle, which again um, includes the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, right? This is where filtration takes place. So um, the anatomically, the renal corpuscle is actually really fascinating. Let's zoom in further. So we're zoomed in even, even further here, and notice that the, the capsule is lined in simple squamous epithelium. This is what they're calling um, the capsular epithelium in this picture, okay? Um, it is continuous with a visceral or glomerular um, epithelium. There we go, visceral epithelium covering the glomerulus, covering the capillary, right? And so, um, okay, so that the capsule is both like the catcher's mitt outside, and it also then wraps around and covers um, the, the glomerular capillaries. And this is going to be helping to create what we call the filtration membrane. And so if you zoom in even further, right, here's that capsular epithelium, and we see the, um, the visceral epithelium covering our individual little capillaries here. So the idea of a filtration membrane is this is going to be our filter, right? Our coffee filter. What, what size pores do we wanna have in here? And so the way this works is we have a few different components here. So notice in our capillary, they're pointing out that there are pores. So these are actually fenestrated capillaries. Do you remember that terminology? We had continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, sinusoidal capillaries, depending on where we were. These fenestrated capillaries have pores in them, okay? And so that is going to allow um, some larger molecules out of the bloodstream that normally wouldn't, say, be sneaking out of a capillary. But then, just outside of the capillary, if you see this blue line, um, this is called the dense layer. It's essentially a basement membrane. Um, it might circle multiple capillaries together like we see in this picture, but it is some connective tissue, right? Again, anything trying to get from the blood to the filtrate needs to be able to get through this um, dense layer. And then the visceral epithelium is made of these specialized cells, I'm in the way, made of these specialized cells called podocytes. So again, site means cell, pod or pod um, typically means foot. And so what we see on these podocytes, mm, I like this picture better, are all these little feet, right? All these little projections. And so notice if you look at like adjacent podocytes, right? If their little feet are overlapping, it leaves little slits in between there, right? And those are called the filtration slits. And again, anything leaving the blood supply has to be able to get um, through those slits. Okay, so those three things really make up what we call the filtration membrane, the capillary, 
which fortunately is fenestrated, gives us lots of room, the basement membrane, some connective tissue, um, and then the, the visceral epithelium, those podocytes. Those three things make up our filter, or what's called the filtration membrane. This is kind of a fun little cell here, um, this mesangial um, cell. This is basically smooth muscle, um, right? So this cell actually has um, contractile abilities, and so it can kind of alter the blood flow between these capillaries. Okay. Um, what else? Okay, so filtration. Filtration is this really important process, and so let's spend a little bit of time making sure we're good on it. And your book does have, this is a really nice um, set of pictures on page 970 and 971. They just don't, they don't blow up big enough um, to use here on the, on the computer screen, right? But they're showing the same things that we were just looking at um, in that other image. Okay, um, I pull this table up a lot, again, out of the old book, but I think they do a really nice job kind of laying out in this table what we're looking at histologically. So again, the um, Bowman's capsule is a simple squamous epithelium, and then all of the capillaries are also covered um, by that visceral um, endothelium, so another simple squamous um, epithelial layer. Ooh, this is a, a great picture of that filtration membrane. So picture anything that's here in the blood. In order to get out, it has to move through the pore, through that dense layer, um, and then between um, parts of the podocyte. So through that filtration slit. Okay, so glomerular filtration. Um, glomerular filtration rate is a value that tells you the amount of filtrate produced each minute. And this tends to be about 125 mils per minute, which means, right, so that's like your average glomerular filtration rate, 125 mils per minute. That means you make 180 liters of filtrate a day. You don't pee that much though, do you? No. This tells you that you end up reabsorbing almost all of that, right? But this glomerular filtration rate um, is super important. And what they're trying to show you in this picture, right, because you want to keep filtering. That's your only opportunity then to make decisions about what to reabsorb and what to let go. So we keep wanting to have about 125 mils per minute. And our body does a really good job um, of maintaining this homeostasis. So um, here's our main factors that um, go into glomerular filtration. So typically what we'd see in order to get a normal glomerular filtration rate, we would have about 10 um, millimeters of mercury. So again, this is a pressure, and so we're reading it in millimeters of mercury. Um, and the way we end up here is we have what's called glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So remember, we looked at hydrostatic pressures and osmotic pressures when we talked about how substances move in and out of the capillaries. Here it is again, right? So glomerular hydrostatic pressure is basically blood pressure, right? Blood pressure in this glomerular um, capillary, okay? The reason you have this pressure is, remember, you had um, an afferent arterial coming in and an efferent arterial leaving. If the efferent is smaller than the afferent, right, then you have this backup. You have this hydrostatic pressure that's going to help force liquids across the filtration membrane. And so you do make adjustments. You'll see this in the in the mass uh, in the smart book assignment, right? You make adjustments to the afferent and the efferent arterial to change glomerular hydrostatic pressure, right? So if you make the afferent bigger and the efferent smaller, you're going to up that hydrostatic pressure, okay? If you do the opposite, if you make the efferent larger or the afferent smaller, you could decrease that hydrostatic pressure, okay? So that's pushing, that's, that's trying to make filtrate. But then notice we have two other factors that are resisting the formation of filtrate. So this one is blood colloid osmotic pressure. And remember that's all those big things like cells and proteins that remain behind in the blood, they have an attraction, an osmotic attraction for water, and so we're pulling water back into um, the blood. And then there's capsular hydrostatic pressure. So as fluid starts building up in the Bowman's capsule, it pushes back on that 
um, membrane. Right? And so this is the smallest of those um, forces, but it is um, it is playing a role in what the overall number is. So notice glomerular hydrostatic pressure minus blood colloid osmotic pressure and capsular hydrostatic pressure is how we ended up, um, well, let's see, 25 plus 15, 30, 40. Yep, that gives us 10 remaining, okay? And so again, um, this is important for um, glomerular filtration rate. Okay, again, same picture um, from your book. They even laid out the math for you, which I thought was pretty um, nice of them. So your body ends up trying to, again, maintain the homeostasis of glomerular filtration rate. Um, the first thing, again, that we always see um, is autoregulation, right? The, the kidney itself tries to fix this. And it can do this... Um, in a few different ways, right? So what they're pointing out here is what if glomerular filtration rate um, drops, right? And so then we're gonna drop urine production as a result. So you can do things like um, dilate those afferent arterioles, right? Try to increase that capsular hydrostatic pressure and constrict the efferent arterioles, right? Make sure the blood backs up against that. And so it's more likely to push um, into the Bowman's capsule. Um, and then those are those mesangial cells, those little contractile cells in the capillaries, so those can make some adjustments as well. And so if you do that, you can increase glomerular pressure, right, and go back to um, kind of normal homeostasis. If that doesn't work, then we move on again to things like um, the nervous system and the endocrine system. And so here we see um, the renin angiotensin system. Now, this one's really interesting because renin is actually released by the kidney. In fact, I'm gonna go back to a picture. It's released by a group of cells called the juxtaglomerular cells. And notice those are right here, right? So between that afferent and efferent um, arterial are the juxtaglomerular cells. This is an endocrine structure, um, anyway, endocrine structure within the kidney. So again, kind of running through this, um, we can talk about it in class if we need, um, but I think we're getting close to having this down, right? Remember um, renin, when it's released from those juxtaglomerular cells, it's going to enter the bloodstream, right? And it does things like it takes, um, angiotensinogen and converts it into angiotensin 1. That goes to the lung where the enzyme ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, um, release, uh, is converted, angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2. Couple things to remember, angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor, right? And so they're pointing out um, that that is going to constrict, in particular, the efferent arterioles, right? Trying to up glomerular filtration rate. Um, angiotensin II also triggers the release of aldosterone. If you remember that one from the adrenal gland, aldosterone increases sodium retention, right? And so we'll see this working on the DCT and the collecting duct. But once you're reabsorbing sodium, right, water wants to follow that. We can up the blood volume, which increases systemic blood pressure, right, throughout the body, which again, would increase glomerular filtration rate, right? Because that would increase um, capillary hydrostatic pressure, okay? It also, this is nice, here's our connection really um, to the nervous system, right? Angiotensin true um, can also trigger some of these neural responses, right? Things like thirst. Um, so we're gonna, it's, we're gonna be told that we're thirsty, we need to consume water. Here you just thought you were thirsty, right? It's actually your kidney, through renin telling you to take a drink. <clears throat> um, we also can directly um, trigger, uh, sorry, through these neural responses, trigger antidiuretic hormone release, which again helps with the reabsorption of water, which ups blood volume, which ups blood pressure, right? Um, and then also through the sympathetic nervous system, we can just increase um, what they're calling here sympathetic motor tone, uh, vasoconstriction, essentially, right? Like just kind of a, like spanks for your blood vessels, right? To keep um, the blood volume inside of the vessels um, and keep that blood pressure good. Okay, 
So again, that's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system doing all those things. Angiotensin too, look at how, I mean, it plays all these huge roles, right? Vasoconstriction, um, thirst, um, ADH release, aldosterone release, etc. Okay. On the, let's see. Oh, look at that. I had zoomed in pictures for you. Um, do keep in mind, right, this is one homeostasis going in one way. If homeostasis has gone the other way, right, think about it in reverse. If blood volume has increased, right, and we're, um, that automatically increases glomerular filtration rate, right? Blood volume increasing, that's going to increase the blood pressure, and that tells us to push more um, across that filtration membrane. So that's kind of a nice automatic thing. Um, but remember, also with increased blood volume, you can overstretch the heart a little bit, right? And you can release the natriuretic peptides, um, atrial natriuretic peptide, brain natriuretic peptide. Um, I think your book calls them atrial natriuretic hormone, maybe? Same thing, ANP, BNP. Um, uh, these natriuretic peptides actually tell us to vasodilate the afferent arterial going into the glomerulus. And remember, that's going to increase um, glomerular filtration rate, right? It increases glomerular hydrostatic pressure. Um, and so that's going to tell us to dump fluids. So we decrease blood volume, we decrease blood pressure. Okay, so just the reverse um, taking place there. So kind of a slick little setup for maintaining um, glomerular filtration rate. Okay, um, I don't have this in front of me. Mm -hmm. I guess let's keep going here. We're on a roll. This is looking like a big chapter. Okay, <clears throat> so we've made this filtrate, right, at the, the renal corpuscle. I just took all of that time on the renal corpuscle on filtration. It's important. The glomerular filtration rate um, is, in fact, <clears throat> important. Now, I mentioned you make like 180 liters of filtrate a day, and of course, you don't pee that out. It would be extremely dilute, and it contains some of the things that you really want to keep, right? You don't want to give up all those salts and the calcium and the glucose and the, um, uh, the water even, right, is important. <clears throat> And one of the things that's really counterintuitive here in the kidney um, is that we didn't actually even get rid of urea yet. So we still have some work to do before this filtrate, right, that we caught in the Bowman's capsule actually goes into um, or leaves, I suppose, the collecting duct as urine. We still have some modifications to make. So let's peek here um, at the proximal convoluted tubule. We said really huge role of the PCT is reabsorption, okay? So something like 70% of the reabsorption is taking place um, at the PCT. So real quick, like those fluids, those ions are gonna move back into the paratubular capillaries and think about the draw that they have, right? That efferent arterial, if all the water moved across the filtration membrane, you got this like sludge in the efferent arterial that's going to have a huge osmotic pull to draw water back out of the filtrate um, and into the blood. Okay, if you look up in close at the proximal convoluted tubule, right, you'll notice that it has um, simple cuboidal epithelium um, and that the apical surface, the surface facing the filtrate, facing the inside of the tube, it has microvilli, right? See all these little microvilli here to increase surface area um, for the reabsorption. And so um, what they're trying to show you here is the reabsorption that's taking place. And again, I mentioned this before, um, but we are going to reabsorb a lot of our solutes. So things like sodium and chloride, um, all of our organic molecules like glucose and amino acids. And then a huge amount um, of water is also reabsorbed here. Now, okay, again, proximal convoluted tubule, simple cuboidal uh, epithelium with microvilli. So we'll look at that um, in lab. This is a, maybe harder than your book, but maybe easier because it's big. But again, notice what's going on here. We have this tubular fluid, right? And we're bringing ions like sodium in, all those organic um, molecules, 
uh, glucose amino acids, those are coming back in. And they're showing you actually some really um, cool things that take place here, right? So glucose is actually going to get moved um, against its uh, concentration gradient, but it is going to be a passive process because we do co-transport with sodium. So sodium um, moving down its concentration gradient right, is going to bring um, glucose with it. So kind of a neat thing. Um, we see that when sodium comes in, we can also have um, some counter transport here. Notice these are all color coded. So purple is our counter transporter here, um, exchanging it for things like hydrogen, right? So to keep the um, ionic balance, if you're bringing cations in, um, you might be kicking cations out. Um, as well. Here you see uh, a sodium potassium pump, so moving against its concentration gradient, bringing potassium into that cell and kicking sodium um, into the extracellular fluid where it can then diffuse back into the blood. So notice into the bloodstream, all of these are dotted, and that is in fact indicating um, that diffusion is taking place. But then in and out of this um, parad a tubular cell, right, the epithelial cells lining um, the tube, we have a lot of different transport um, mechanisms, right? So just a quick reminder on how some of this works. Across that plasma membrane, the only things that can go directly through, here we go, are those lipid-soluble molecules. Here they're showing us um, cholesterol or closely related estrogen, testosterone. Remember, oxygen and carbon dioxide are actually lipid-soluble. They go straight through the phospholipid bilayer. Um, everything else is going to need some sort of um, protein, and we'll look at some of the specifics on those transport proteins, and then even larger molecules might, re might rely on something like bulk transport, so endocytosis or exocytosis, right? So as far as um, transport proteins go, um, this image is showing you facilitated diffusion. So remember, if it's diffusion, it's still going down its concentration gradient. Some of our transmembrane proteins are always open as a channel, right? And that would be facilitated diffusion. Um, but here we see a protein where when a molecule binds to that protein, it changes the protein's shape, dumps it on the other side of the cell. But notice, high concentration to low, right? Facilitated diffusion is always passive. Here's that sodium potassium pump, right? Always bringing two potassium in against its concentration gradient um, and kicking three sodium out against its concentration gradient. We need ATP in order to make that happen. Um, but then here is what I was referring to with um, sodium and glucose. So think about this. You keep pumping sodium out of the cell against its concentration gradient. So the sodium levels are high outside of the cell and they want to diffuse back in. And so then you set up this other transport protein that does allow sodium to move down its concentration gradient and it sneaks in a glucose. I just think that's really fun. So secondary active transport. The glucose is technically moving passively, right? There is no ATP required, but it's only getting away with that because um, it's, it's hitching a ride with sodium. Isn't your body cool? Okay. So again, as you look through some of these um, images, whether here on the presentation or in your textbook, pay attention, right, to how um, these different molecules are moving. Some of this we will see um, becomes important, right? So if glucose needs a specific transport protein, you can hit a point where you have so much glucose in your blood and therefore so much glucose in your filtrate that you actually can't bring it all back into the blood. And so we'll talk about that transport maximum later in the chapter. Okay. I'll try to remember to talk about that transport maximum later in the chapter. Yeah, I think there's a slide for it. Okay, so again, at the proximal convoluted tubule, all the organics, right? So we're going to use things um, like that facilitated diffusion, um, co-transport, glucose, amino acids, um, fatty acids, vitamins, right? Anything that's organic. Also, we're seeing the ions. We do use some active um, transport here. Right? So we see things like um, different ion pumps, um, 
taking place there. Again, sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, magnesium, phosphate, sulfate, anything that's an ion, right? All these things with the pluses and minuses. Um, water, tons of water reabsorption. This is through osmosis. Um, so again, it totally depends on, it's following those salts. So the more that are coming back to the blood, um, the more water um, that follows. Um, okay. The nephron loop. Oh, sorry. Um, here at the PCT, again, very limited secretion. Um, when we finish at the proximal convoluted tubule, right, so we kind of hit this line, um, it is important to notice, right, that the concentration of the filtrate at this point actually is very similar to the blood because we reabsorbed most of the water, we reabsorbed most of the ions. Um, and so at the end of the PCT, the filtrate is about 300 milliosmoles, right? The same um, as the blood. Just for perspective, I know that's kind of a weird number um, for you. Things like fresh water, right, would have very few salts. Fresh water is about five milliosmoles, our blood, and our filtrate at the PCT is about 300 milliosmoles. Um, sea wa like water from the ocean um, is about a thousand milliosmoles, right? So our blood um, is kind of in between there. Okay, so the nephron loop then. So at the nephron loop, let's see order here. Okay, at the nephron loop, we have this super cool, um, what we call a countercurrent mechanism. So this this section of the nephron is indeed what's going to allow us to make concentrated urine. Now. We set up the concentration gradient using this nephron loop, using this countercurrent um, multiplication mechanism, but we're going to see the collecting duct take advantage of that. Let's see if this makes sense. So basically in this thin descending limb of the nephron loop, right, notice what we have here. We have these squamous um, cells, right, simple squamous cells. On the ascending limb, it's going to be simple um, cuboidal cells. These Thin, uh, the thin descending loop is going to be very permeable to water and relatively impermeable to solutes. So here in this picture, we see in the descending limb, lots and lots of water being reabsorbed. Excuse me. In the ascending limb, right, and these are right next to each other, but in the ascending limb, we're relatively impermeable um, to water right? We just don't have the right transport protein. We just don't have aquaporins in this thick ascending limb. And so what we're going to see um, is that we are going to um, actively transport things like sodium and chloride out of the cell, okay? Um, and so again, if you zoomed in on, this is the, notice they're looking here at the ascending limb, our tubular fluid, we see um, chloride um, and sodium, and potassium all moving out of the filtrate and into what is called the paratubular fluid, okay? So it doesn't go directly into the capillary, right? It's moving into that interstitial pace, space or that peritubular fluid. Now, what they're trying to show you in this picture is notice that it's lighter up here and they're saying the paratubular fluid at this point is similar to the filtrate, it's about 300 milliosmoles, and then it goes to 600 and 900 and 1200. As you get deeper in the renal medulla, we get saltier and saltier, right? And it is due to this countercurrent transport. So, okay, what throws people here is notice this transport of sodium and chloride out. So when the filtrate hits the ascending limb, it's pretty concentrated. We have lots of salt, and so it's easy to move salts out into the medulla, right? And so we very much, we drop in osmolarity of this fluid, right? It's down to 300 now, but we can still pump more out, right? And we become more dilute, and we can still pump a little more out. But notice most of it got pumped out down deep here, and so that area is saltier, okay? Now, what that means for the thin, for the descending limb is that when that filtrate comes into the limb at about 300 milliosmoles, right, as it starts to descend and this is getting saltier 
out here, right? It was 600. Water wants to leave, right? It's going to move down its concentration gradient. So 300 milliosmoles is pretty watery. That water is going to move into that interstitial space, but that concentrates the filtrate. Right now it's at 600 milliosmoles. It's getting kind of salty, but as it's dropping in the medulla, it's even saltier outside, right? And so you can still get water to leave and it's getting more concentrated, but as you drop, the medulla is even saltier and so water leaves, right? And so now picture we get 1200 milliosmol. We have some pretty concentrated filtrate, but it's gonna move up the ascending limb and we are gonna pump those salts out so that by the time we're leaving the nephron loop, we're even more dilute than when we entered. We're at about 100 milliosmoles. Now this drives students crazy and I totally get it, but realize, okay, this is nice. They put this here in here, right? When we get to our collecting duct, the collecting duct is going to pierce through the medulla and it is going to use that same concentration gradient to pull water and more water and more water until we in fact can make reasonably concentrated urine at about 1200 milliosmoles, right? So the thing to keep in mind, I know, the thing to keep in mind with the nephron loop, right? is in the ascending limb, sodium and chloride are pumped out into the paratubular fluid, and that sets up this concentration gradient, right? Water is leaving the descending limb, that's strictly through osmosis, right? Um, and as it descends, the filtrate gets more and more concentrated, which actually is going to allow us to speed up the pumping when we move into that ascending limb. So it's kind of this weird feedback mechanism. Okay, so that is the way countercurrent multiplication works, right, is that we can get a saltier and saltier and saltier, right, um, paratubular fluid in the medulla that's going to allow us eventually um, to concentrate urine. Just just hasn't happened yet. Okay, so we'll be, we'll be back there, right? Um, again, this is um, how your book is showing this happen. Um, only thing that's a little frustrating is, is they're indicating, you know, more of this moving into the bloodstream, but really a lot of this, um, we really should be thinking about this um, in that paratubular fluid because we're not going directly back to the blood, but we will, we will pull stuff into the blood as well. Okay. And again, that's just zoomed in. I'm going to zoom past. Okay. And then we're to the distal convoluted tubule. So um, at the distal convoluted tubule, notice we do still have um, reabsorption. Again, we pointed out that this is going to be variable and it's really under um, hormonal control. And so we are able to use things like aldosterone. And again, what aldosterone, what this hormone does is actually tells these cells to synthesize and incorporate into their cell membranes more sodium channels, right? So um, we'll be reabsorbing um, a lot of sodium in response to aldosterone in the distal convoluted tubule. One thing I wanted to point out, and let's see if they show this. Um, okay, so this they're pointing out, oh, I'm in the way. They're pointing out this is the aldosterone sensitive portion of the DCT and the collecting duct. So <clears throat> they put an A in here to show that it's an aldosterone regulated pump, right? But it is a sodium, uh, it is meant for sodium reabsorption. To bring that ion into the cell and eventually into the blood, notice that we have to exchange it with another cation, right? And quite often that is going to be uh, potassium. We will also see times, uh, depending on blood pH, where we could use hydrogen instead of potassium. So in an attempt to get rid of hydrogen, um, we'll, we'll reabsorb sodium and ditch hydrogen. Um, but often sodium reabsorption means potassium excretion. And this is important um, because when you put people on certain blood pressure medicines, right, you start messing um, with sodium balance, um, which doesn't tend to be that big of a deal, um, but that in turn often messes up potassium balance. And as we will see in our next chapter, um, that potassium um, balance can actually be really uh, problematic. Okay. So, whoop, where am I? Okay. 
So again, still at the DCT, reabsorption, um, sodium and potassium are exchanged under aldosterone's control. Um, here we're looking, and also at the DCT, I will mention again, um, calcium reabsorption in response to parathyroid hormone. Um, you do need vitamin D in order for that to happen. Um, here we're looking at um, acid base balance taking place um, at the DCT. Here's your favorite equation, right? Carbon dioxide and water become carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen. The kidney then gets to decide, right? If we have enough hydrogen in the blood, right? And we actually want to get rid of some, we can put that in the urine and we can also then reabsorb bicarbonate, which is a nice buffer to put in the blood. We will talk about this more with acid base balance in the next chapter. Or um, if if we don't have enough hydrogen, we could do this differently. We could bring hydrogen into the blood and we could go ahead and excrete um, bicarbonate. We also at the um, DCT then don't forget why water um, is reabsorbed here as well. And again, that's under the control of antidiuretic hormone. I should, sorry, I'm gonna scoot back. I had so many pictures here, right? On the DCT, also keep in mind, this is a major site um, of, whoops, sorry. I pushed a button, there we go, of secretion. So secretion at the DCT, right? Um, what you have to keep in mind is those same tubular cells, they absorb substances that are in high concentration in the paratubular fluid, and they will secrete them into filtrate. So maybe, right? So you can even think about, right, potassium being secreted into the tubular fluid, right? That's going into the filtrate. This is bound um, for excretion. This is where we actually add urea into the filtrate. We didn't filter it in the first place. We we're actually going to secrete it. Um, different drugs, different toxins, um, hydrogen ions, if we need to change acid base or bicarbonate, depending on how we need to change um, acid base. Um, deamination occurs in the, the DCT. I said this would actually help the, the liver um, to remove that nitrogen group from an amino acid. Um, and so, the waste product of that, right, ammonia. Um, how do I say that? The waste product of that ammonia could also get um, secreted into um, the filtrate at this point. And so it actually makes a lot of sense for it to happen here um, at the DCT because we can immediately um, ditch that waste. Um, okay. So on to the collecting duct. Holy cow, this is becoming long, but I think we're almost there. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So the collecting duct. Again, it's not technically part of the nephron, but it still has a huge part to play um, in urine production. So I don't know why humans have to draw this imaginary line. Here we go. Um, so the collecting duct, again, notice there's lots of different entry points, lots of different um, proximal convoluted tubules dumping in here at once, right? So it's receiving filtrate from lots of different nephrons, and we eventually want to take that out, right, to the renal calyx, eventually um, the sinus. So along the collecting duct, what you'll find here um, is typically mostly columnar um, epithelium, and this columnar epithelium, this is going to be um, our last chance, right, to adjust the composition of the filtrate, right, to make those final changes to osmotic concentration and to the volume of the urine. Okay, and so here, um, I did like this um, image from your book, right, again, as we get dive deeper into the medulla, remember that concentration gradient that we set up with the nephron loop. Now we see the collecting duct has to run through the medulla. And the thing to think about, right, is like the whole medulla, like in three dimensions, has this concentration gradient. And so as a collecting duct runs through it, right, the filtrate coming into the collecting duct might only be 100 milliosmol. That's really watery, very few salts, right? 
But when 100 milliosmoles sees 200 outside, water wants to leave, right? And we get more concentrated, maybe 200 in here. But then it says 300 outside and it wants to leave. And so it gets more concentrated, right? And so we're 300, we're getting saltier. Uh, but then outside is 400 and so water leaves and then it drops, right? And so this is how, right, we are going to um, keep reabsorbing water if we want to concentrate urine. Now, say the blood volume has gotten too high and we need to ditch water right? That is where things like atrial natriuretic peptide come in to say like, no, 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 let's just like, right? Let's, let's not put um, aquaporins out here, right? And again, so much of this is under, say, the control of antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic hormone would be active over here. It's actually putting channels for this water reabsorption. If you don't want to reabsorb that water if you need to let it go you have too much of it right you had like three cups of coffee this morning it was tea two big mugs um right you don't want to keep all of that water and so antidiuretic hormone um is not going to be used and so then we're not going to put the water channels and this allows us to create a large volume of very dilute urine right just flush all that excess water out it's a pretty neat little system there can you imagine if you had to like control it just by the amount you drank? I mean, essentially this means you don't have to think about it. You're like, ah, my mouth's a little dry from talking so much. I'm going to have another slug of water, right? And the kidney is going to decide whether you actually needed that in your blood supply or whether that's going to mess things up, right? It's maintaining homeostasis of, oh, so many things. Okay. Um, so again, reinforcing this idea that the nephron loop set up the concentration gradient, but the collecting duct is going to take advantage of it, right? In particular, if you want to concentrate urine, and here we see again, antidiuretic hormone inserting um, water channels so that we do reabsorb water. Um, so at the collecting duct, right, um, we do reabsorb sodium. That would be under the control of aldosterone. Um, we do reabsorb water. That is under the control of antidiuretic hormone. Um, again, we can do acid-base balance here, right? So hydrogen and bicarbonate. Um, we do, and this is counterintuitive, we do reabsorb urea. Um, it ends up being, so from the collecting duct, if we reabsorb urea, it stays out here in this paratubular fluid, and it actually becomes part of um, this concentration gradient for us. There is some secretion that takes place at the collecting duct as well. Again, this is the whole, like, if pH um, is too low, we can actively secrete hydrogen um, into the filtrate, reabsorb bicarbonate, um, and the opposite is also true. If pH is too high, right, we would secrete bicarbonate into the filtrate and reabsorb hydrogen into that paratubular fluid, right? But that is secretion if we're trying to put it into um, the filtrate. Again, tons of hormones acting at this part. Okay, so that's our urine formation. So just kind of wrapping things up then, um, thinking about what urine um, should be like right? Um, again, this is only like 1% of the filtrate. This is what remained after all this reabsorption secretion is taking place. Um, notice pH can vary um, pretty widely. We don't care so much about the pH of the urine. We care about the pH of the blood. And so we are going to, to make the pH of the urine whatever it needs to be um, in order to, to keep blood homeostasis. And we'll talk about this more next week. There is a limit on that, right? You can't just pump a ton of hydrogen ions into the filtrate. Um, you do need uh, a buffer. Uh, you do need something to accept them um, in the filtrate. Um, specific gravity, so this is kind of funny, right? Um, osmolarity, remember I said the max you could do was around 1200, so they're saying 1300, right? So this would be a concentrated urine, this would be a dilute urine. Specific gravity is the same idea, it's a measure of how salty something is. So this would be a, a fairly salty urine, uh, this would be a very dilute urine. It's mostly water right? Mostly water with a little bit of, of wastes and ions and whatever we didn't want um, in there. Depending on your water balance, right, you can vary in how much you produce. It should be a light 
you know, light yellow clear. Um, if it's if it's very dark, that's a good indication uh, that you're probably dehydrated. Um, you should go ahead um, and consume more. Love this odor. It varies with composition. The classic example um, being asparagus, right? Can can change the odor there. Um, this is sort of kind of true. Um, there shouldn't really be bacteria in your bladder, though there are more studies showing that maybe there are some that we just didn't know about, but we get along fine with. So it may not be sterile, um, but you shouldn't have bacteria that would cause infection um, in the urine. But um, this is important when you're doing, say, urine collection for your analysis. Keep in mind um, that it's not always true of the urethra. Um, and so you do need to make sure uh, that patients are actually cleaning properly before um, avoiding a urine sample so that we see what's actually in the urine and not just maybe what was in the urethra. Okay, I put this in here. This I thought was just a really nice summary and it reminds us again that that efferent arteriole, sure enough, those paratubular capillaries are going to be all over all of this. And, and when we say we reabsorb water, that we're actually going to go ahead and put that into the blood, right? When we reabsorb uh, you know, all those glucose and nutrients from the PCT, it's going into um, the blood. Okay, so zoomed in, same thing, it goes into the blood. Paratubular capillaries are important. Um, okay, this is, I had mentioned I would talk about the tubular maximum. I should have just talked about it earlier. Remember, um, those transporters that are in the cell membranes, they essentially, it's just like an enzyme. You can basically have too much substrate, right? You can max out how much it can actually transport. And so this is an interesting one, right? Because glucose enters the urine if there's enough of it in your blood. And so what we'll see is that when there's a small amount of glucose that passes, um, oh, sorry, uh, so when they say urine, they mean finished product here. So as long as you have less than 320 uh, milligrams per minute entering the filtrate, none of it should actually end up in the urine. It should all get reabsorbed by the PCT, right? Um, and they're pointing out this tubular maximum. This is the point where those glucose transporters just can't move it fast enough back into the blood and so it will stay in the urine and so the nice thing about this is we can then use the amount of glucose in the urine to figure out right how much glucose really is in the blood um, and you shouldn't have glucose in your urine you should reabsorb it and so glucose in the urine is indicative um, that you have too much glucose in the blood so that would be indicative of something like diabetes mellitus and this also explains why people with diabetes mellitus pee so much, right? Because if that glucose stays in the filtrate, now we have this osmotic draw towards the filtrate. And instead of reabsorbing water, it just keeps getting flushed in the urine, right? Which makes them thirsty, polydipsia. And so they're drinking a lot, they're peeing a lot, um, and they've got glucose in the urine. Okay, um, we will in lab, we'll touch on this histology um, a little more. Do um, recall, I'll point out a couple things and then we're out of here, right? Um, that we're dealing a lot with um, transitional epithelium. So when you look at the ureter, the tube that goes down to the bladder, and then also the bladder itself, right? Do note that transitional um, epithelium, that's going to let both of these structures um, actually expand. To, to make room for the urine moving through. The ureter does have smooth muscle, right? So you actually do like peristalsis that pushes the urine um, down towards uh, the bladder. Um, and then outside of that is connective tissue. When you look at the, um, the bladder, yep, here it is. Again, transitional epithelium. Notice how much muscle there actually is um, in the outer layers of the bladder. So the detrusor muscle here um, is going to actually be the muscle that you contract in order to, to force um, urine out of the bladder. So um, the detrusor muscle helps you micturate, right? Micturition is the technical term um, for peeing. You do have um, on the bladder um, an involuntary uh, sphincter that basically as enough urine accumulates um, inside of the bladder, it's going to push on this um, internal urethral sphincter and that is going to both trigger, um, that triggers your brain to say, hey, you need to pee, 
right? Uh, fortunately, the external urethral uh, sphincter is going to be under voluntary um, control. The urethra is actually quite a bit longer in males, right, than it is uh, in females. There's the female urethra. Um, and so this ends up leading to a couple um, different things. So um, females tend to get more urinary tract infections because bacteria have easier access up into um, the bladder and therefore the ureters and even into the kidneys, which is really bad um, to have uh, an infection travel that far up. Um, it also means that females um, tend to have a little harder time um, with control um, of the bladder, particularly following childbirth. So uh, we'll talk about this in a few chapters. You do have this um, band of muscle that helps kind of hold the urogenital organs up um, in the body, and it's called the urogenital diaphragm, right? Just like the diaphragm for your lungs, it's a diaphragm over that opening to the pelvic cavity. Um, and actually the external urethral sphincter is kind of embedded in that diaphragm. So after childbirth, if that diaphragm gets um, really stretched out, that can make um, it harder uh, to control that voluntary um, control of bladder release. Um, last but not least, um, the micturition reflex, right? And so this is that, that signal that you have to pee. And so what we'll see here, right, is as the bladder is stretching, right, we're going to send that signal, um, back to the spinal cord here. Um, so it is, it's about at 200 mils of, um, urine in the bladder that this begins, right? And so we're getting... Do we give a, a sensation, right, it's going up to the brain here, um, indicating that we do in ha fact have to pee? Um, and then, of course, oops, sorry, that blue one is actually the motor output. This white one is the sensation going up to the brain. This blue one then is what gives us control over the skeletal muscle um, of the external urethral sphincter. And so um, you can actually fill the bladder to the point where you uh, – override control um, of this reflex. Um, last thing I want to point out, you did have an awesome little kind of vignette thing in your book um, that goes through dialysis. Um, and so you should totally take a look at this. Dialysis is just this massively used procedure, um, at least here in the U.S. And so, sorry, page. One, well, we're into the thousands, 1,002, 1,003 actually has a really nice um, kind of spread about acute renal failure and the need for dialysis. Um, and dialysis essentially is trying to take the place of the kidney, and we'll see that it does not do a perfect job, but it tries. Okay, an overview for you. I'll leave you with that, and I will see you in lab. Have a good one.